people have a lot of wounds for whatever reason, whatever their personal experiences might be, oh. and it becomes very difficult for them to disentangle the actual gospel from everything else they were told was the gospel. And so sometimes it's just sitting with somebody and crying with those who cry and ministering to those needs first uh, to show them that you know Christians aren't all just you know these intellectual snobs or whatever else they might think Christians are, uh, but that I genuinely care about you and I love you and I want to know you know what's going on in your heart. How do we engage our family and friends in these kinds of gospel-centered conversations? It, it's not easy, right? You're, you're talking about the hockey game. You're talking about the price of gasoline. And all of a sudden, you're like, this person needs to know Jesus. How can I get into conversations like that? Uh, often it happens when, when, when they ask us questions and, and sort of tee it up for us. So what are some of the common things that you're, you're getting from people right now that they want to know about? Well, when I go and speak and I'll do a Q&A, typically this is going to be a Christian audience. So yeah. what I find from young people is that they're not so much asking, does God exist? But they're trying to reconcile, is God good? And that's the, the question I think a lot of young people are asking because they're reading some difficult passages in the Old Testament and they're saying, well, how could God, you know, cause a flood and kill that many people? And so I think those are the types of questions that a lot of young people are wrestling with. Mm. But uh, I think in general that even among the atheists and things that I deal with online or the progressive Christians, there's really a lot of talk about is the God of the Bible even good? And so it's not so much the question, does he exist anymore? Although I'm sure, you know, there's, that's still a, a conversation, of course, but it's really, is the God of the Bible somebody that we would want to worship? Is he worthy of worship? So what are some of the characteristics of God? What's, what's some of the foundational stuff that we should know about the character of God to be able to answer questions like that? Right. So I think one of the reasons that's such a big question right now is because I think if you look past the maybe the last 20 years or so of church history and you look at the, a lot of the media and things that have been marketed to young people and even to the church, you see a really kind of dumbed down version of God. We see a, a God without wrath, a God without um, judgment, a, a God that wouldn't send anyone to hell. And that gets so repeated over and over again, we almost lose the the attributes of God that are so important to his character, mm. which are things like his wrath. And this is something I actually love to talk to young people about the wrath of God, because it's something I think they they have a lot of misunderstandings about. They might yes. be relating um, the, the wrathful, petty, uh, impetuous, drunken rages of people, maybe adults in their lives that were abusive, and they, they think, well, is that what God's wrath is? And so I love to try to untangle some of those knots yes. and help them understand that God's wrath, there was a theologian, I can't remember who it was, but he said, God's wrath is our only hope. And the reason for that is because look at look at everybody crying out for justice right now. God's wrath is what brings his justice. There will be justice. And that's why the gospel is so beautiful, because each one of us, we have a choice. We can actually receive God's justice or we can receive his mercy. We have that choice now to trust in him or reject him. But we want God to have wrath because that means he will judge sin. He will He will provide a place and keep his promise to wipe away every tear from our eye where there'll be no more crying, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain for eternity in his presence. And he can't do that if he doesn't have wrath for sin. If he just lets sin into heaven, then heaven's just going to be another version of hell. And so I I think helping people understand why these doctrines are so beautiful, it's not like God is split into pieces where, gosh, we don't really understand his judgment and his wrath over here because his love seems like something else. They're literally the same thing. God is wrathful because he is love. Alisa, what about everyday conversations? When you want to introduce like what we just talked about, into a conversation, do you wait for somebody to ask you, well, how could your God be so good if he's gonna, or do you bring up the conversations by, I don't know, asking them good questions? I, I think it can go either way. And what I always tell people, and it, from my own experience, is that 
conversations like that tend to go better when you kind of do a little diagnosis first. In apologetics, I've often heard it said, behind every question is a questioner. There's somebody asking the question for a reason. So, for example, if somebody asks about the moral character of God in the Old Testament, there may be something in their life where there, there's something underneath that question. Mm-hmm. And maybe if we can get to what that is, then we can better provide an answer or have a conversation. But so a couple examples here of just how this works out in my own life. Number one, I've learned that it is perfectly not just okay, but actually one of the most powerful apologetics can be to just say, I don't know. You know, that's a great question. I've never thought about that myself. Let's figure that out together. Because then you're inviting someone into a back and forth type of conversation rather than just sort of lording yourself over them and saying, well, here's what the correct answer is. And so I think people get intimidated to start getting into apologetic conversations with people because they think, well, what if I don't know the answer? But there is so much beauty in just saying, you know, I don't know. Give me a couple weeks. I'm going to look into that. And can we come back for coffee and discuss that? Um, Another way I do this in my daily life is with my kids. Now, this drives them crazy. I will admit this to you, but um, (laughs) I sometimes will take statements that they make and show if you carry that out like all the way down the rabbit trail, what is the end result of what you're saying right now? So here's an example. One of my children, I will not say which one, said to me, hey, mom, did you know that words don't have meanings? And I said, really? Where did you hear that? And she said, well, Spider-Man said that. And I said, wow, thank you so much for just offering to do the dishes when you get home from school. I'll be sure and save them for you. And she was like, what? I didn't offer to do this. I said, oh, but words don't have meaning. So I can just interpret your words any way that I like. The, the, you know, the, the intent of the person communicating the words doesn't really matter because words don't have meaning. So thank you so much. I will save the dishes for you. And then, of course, my my child was like, all right, I get it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but there's right. ways you can show or you can show them that it doesn't work logically even. How do you navigate emotionally charged conversations? What if somebody does get upset with you and they think that you are trying to, you know, one-up them or you've touched on a hot button issue that actually is very painful to them and they get upset with you? Uh, What do you do? I think in those types of situations, you stop and you listen and there's, if somebody's becoming emotionally charged about something, there's a wound there. There's something there that's causing that emotional reaction. And what I would probably tend to do in that moment is put the intellectual arguments aside for a moment and minister to the person's emotional needs. Mm. Maybe try to figure out, um, you know, what, what has happened. In many cases, maybe somebody had a really bad church experience where they experienced legitimate spiritual abuse or, or something along those lines. And I think in that case, acknowledging that and and uh, cry with those who, who cry, the Bible says. And I think that can be a very powerful apologetic to say, you know, maybe what your particular experience is, can you tell me about that? Because I, I don't like that that happened to you. I, I don't, uh, Jesus doesn't like that that happened to you. I want to hear about that if you, if you want to share it. And then minister to the needs of that person and then worry about the intellectual stuff after because often people, in my study of even this movement of deconstruction, what I find is that people have a lot of wounds for whatever reason, whatever their personal experiences might be, uh. and it becomes very difficult for them to disentangle the actual gospel from everything else they were told was the gospel. And so sometimes it's just sitting with somebody and crying with those who cry and ministering to those needs first uh, to show them that you know Christians aren't all just you know these intellectual snobs or whatever else they might think Christians are, uh, but that I genuinely care about you and I love you and I want to know, you know, what's going on in your heart. I think that that can be a, a, an important way to show the love of Christ to our friends and family. Elisa, what are some resources that people can get their hands on to teach them how to use apologetics uh, graciously and effectively? Well, there, thankfully, we're living in the digital age where there are some great podcasts. You've had a lot of really great guests on your show to help equip people, many of whom have written wonderful books. I would, as far as the how, like how to have conversations, there's lots of apologetics books that give you the the what, the actual answers to a lot of the questions. But there's a great book called Tactics by Greg Kokel that can help you learn how to ask really well-placed questions to keep a conversation going mm. without uh, seeming like you're just lecturing somebody. 
somebody or, or you can navigate those emotionally charged conversations. I think that's a really good resource. Um, there are some really great uh, podcasts out there. And uh, thankfully, there's just audiobooks. I have so many different ways for people to take in content these days. Hey, I'm Kirk Cameron. Thanks for watching this clip from my interview with Elisa Childers. Please like and comment on this video. And if you're not subscribed, please hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss another episode.